to session three of Habakkuk, The Foundation of Faith. Today is going to be interesting, I think, because today faith is introduced. God speaks that famous line, the just shall live by faith, for the first time as we read it today. But it won't be until the end of the book, and then beyond that, even till the end of the study, that we pick up that, that thread and all the threads that come from it and tie them together and present a full picture of what it, God means by faith. But today it starts. Last week, Habakkuk asked God some important questions. He started by saying, God, the wicked in our own land are surrounding the righteous. They are oppressing us. The justice is perverted. What are we going to do? Are you sitting idly by? Are you lazy? Why aren't you acting on our behalf? And God says, I have a plan. I am going to act on your behalf. I am sending in the dreaded Babylonians, or the Chaldeans, as your Bible might say, it's the same people. I am sending them in to destroy and punish the rebellious and idolatrous and the wicked in your land, among my own people. It's all taken care of. And Habakkuk says, another question for God, he said, I, I understand that, I believe it, and I, I acknowledge we deserve it. But don't you think it's a little unfair, a little unbalanced? We are your treasured possession, and they're pagan and wicked and cruel. Why, you shouldn't be using them against us. It's like he said, I didn't, I didn't mean send in the Babylonians, God. I, I didn't mean uh, send in the cartels. I didn't mean send in the terrorists. I didn't mean allow some horribly de deadly disease to, to come across our country. I didn't mean that. What are you thinking, God? Well, perhaps God is thinking that in this country we abort roughly one-fifth of all of our babies. That's a pretty high number. There are several other heinous sins that have gone unchecked in this country. It could be he's thinking of that, but we don't know. But he answers Habakkuk, and his answer is basically what we're going to look at today. You know, he listens to Habakkuk. This heartens me. And he addresses Habakkuk's mind and Habakkuk's heart with his answers. Okay, I'm going to start reading today in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. This is how God begins. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Okay, you know, there's a lot of important stuff right there. First of all, God says, write what I'm going to tell you down. Write it clearly, write it plainly, so that everyone can read it in understanding and may run with it. Now, I just want to uh, look at two things here first. One is write it down, the importance of that, the written vision, so that people can read it and understand. Some of you might actually not be connecting all the dots because I don't always connect all the dots, believe me. I'm famous for it. But, and are saying to yourself, oh, if only we had that vision, if we could still find a copy of that. Ta-da! That's what the Bible is. That's what the book of Habakkuk is. It's the vision God gave Habakkuk and that he wrote down, and we do have it preserved today. The other thing I want to just look at is the word run. Write it down so that he who reads it may run. What does that mean? The temptation is to think it means that he may run away from it. If he's warned about what's happening, he'll be able to run away. Well, I'm sorry to say that is not what it means. The one thing that is not included in the teaching and the solution that God gives Habakkuk is the possibility of running away or escaping. Wouldn't it be nice if, if it was? But that's just not the way it works in the real world. It didn't in that day and it doesn't in this day. But he does tell Habakkuk how to thrive through it all and that's what we'll be looking at. You know, I wanted to think just a minute here about the concept of escaping problems. 
Um, Dan and I have a policy. We don't teach on what's not written. We teach on what's written. And there is no teaching here on escapism. I just want to make sure we understand that we're not talking about running away from the problem. I, um, I love escaping a problem. I do. My mom used to tell me all the years I was growing up, from little girl and on, every once in a while she'd say, you know, you're just like an ostrich. When things start getting tough, you just go bury your head in the sand and there you, there you sit until, until it's all done. Um, you know, I, it, that's true. I'm very much that way, you know. I, I know nothing. I see nothing. Um, and I look for ways of escaping my stress. For me, the chief way of doing that is with the television. I'll be honest with you. I don't allow it to interfere with my daily duties and I, I don't watch shows where I'm enjoying other people's sin. But there's a lot out there that is pure escapism and I love it. And I probably watch it more than you do and maybe even more than I should because for me it is an escape from the stresses of life. So it's a very real problem. Let me um, read to you something King David wrote about trying to escape. This is nothing new. And if King David grappled with the problem, I don't think we need to feel bad that we do as well. I'm going to read from Psalm 55, first verses one through eight. Could just as well have been Habakkuk writing this. It says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. My enemies shout at me, making loud and wicked threats. They bring trouble on me and angrily hunt me down. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to us in our long and varied ministry career several times. You know, we are not universally well loved <laughs> or respected. Um, and that, you know, there's troubles from time to time and it's hard to take. And I just want to run away. I just want to put uh, hands over my ears and make myself something good to eat and turn on the TV and stay there for a week. That's, that's what I would really like to do. He goes on and he says, My heart pounds in my chest. The terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me and I can't stop shaking. Now I have had a few people either call me or text me or talk to me in the last several months uh, saying exactly that. Saying, I'm scared to death. I'm scared of the political situation in America, what's happening to us. I'm scared of the coronavirus. Are we going to die? I'm scared of you know, fill in the blank. So this is very real. And I'm, there's no censure here. Uh, if David grappled with it, I don't think we need to feel badly that we grapple with it as well. But let's keep reading. Then he says, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. Then I would fly away and rest. I would fly far away to the quiet of the wilderness. How quickly I would escape from, far from this wild storm of hatred. Isn't that exactly what some of you would like to do? Fly away with wings like a dove and find a pretty deserted island somewhere with waves lapping the shore and escape this whole mess. I can think of more than one mess in my life that I'm involved in in one way or another that I would just love to escape from. Can't. So it behooves me to find the way through. Then David says in verse 16, and here this little word that I'm about to read is the strongest word in scripture. It is the most powerful word in the entire Bible. I'm not kidding. He says, but I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Every time you read the word but or nevertheless in the word of God, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Everything turns completely on that little word. I, but I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon, and night I cry out in my distress and the Lord does hear my voice. He ransoms me and keeps me safe from the battle waged against me. Though many still oppose me, God who has ruled forever will hear me 
and humble them. For my enemies refuse to change their ways and they do not fear God. Saying the problems continue. The battles wage around me. The attacks against me and my integrity continue. And I wish I could escape, but I'm going to give it all to God. I'm, he will rescue me. He will keep me safe. And he will, when the time is right, step on my enemies. We're going to see that in Habakkuk today as well. So it's okay to feel like we just need to escape. And it's okay to find some pleasant ways to do that once in a while. Absolutely, it's okay. But let's make sure that we're going to the Lord and to his word and letting him help and deliver and equip us for the journey. So he may run who reads it. That means run to obey. It could mean the, the runners that got the vision because remember there was no Pony Express, there was no stagecoach, there was no mail delivery system other than runners. So the first person would get whatever was being sent out into the kingdom from the king and run with it to the next post. And then the next person would run with it to the next post. And so it, it might mean so that he who, the runner, can, we'll, we'll see how important it is and he'll hurry up through the land with that message. But I'm sure it also means that the people who receive it can read it, understand it, and run with it. Take it to the bank because it will save their lives during the coming trouble. We'll keep coming back to that principle. When you read the vision, the word of God, anywhere in the Bible, run with it. Take it to the bank, and your salvation will be coming soon. Verse 3, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. A couple of really important things here. One is the appointed time. Everything is on God's calendar. He has a starting day for things and an ending day for things. It's all planned out. To remember that God sees us and all of time as one big today. And he knows exactly what he wants to do to complete his plan in the world or in my life. And all of the things he has planned are appointed. There will be a moment when God says, now. That's reassuring to me. And then he, he says, you know, it, it might seem slow to you because you don't look from my vantage point. You're down there, you know, right in the middle of it. And it might seem like it's delaying, but it isn't. It will be right on time, my time, which is the perfect time. So wait for it. Well, he goes on to say in verse 4, Behold, that means pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm about to say. The soul of the unrighteous is puffed up. It is not upright in him. That means he's, he, he looks to himself and his own strength, and, and uh, he, he doesn't look to me. So he's going to meet his demise is what's coming next. But here's another little but in verse 4. But the righteous, my people, who believe in me and live by my word shall live by his faith that means shall flourish and thrive doesn't necessarily just mean limp along breathing the word in Hebrew is much stronger and it means to thrive and to flourish to be revived by his faith the word is literally faithfulness so here God introduces this life-changing concept, and it's going to change your life when we come to a full understanding of it. And it's done so kind of unobtrusively, because what follows is a long chapter talking about those horrible Babylons and Babylonians and what God is going to do to them. Um, but he begins by addressing this for Habakkuk. Uh, but this, I'm going to tell you first, Habakkuk, how you can have victory during all of this. I don't want you worrying about it. I don't want you stressing out when I start telling you all the horrible things that are going to happen. 
um, I want you to know and to understand I'm on it. And you, if you believe in me, look to me, live by my word, you will not only survive it, you will thrive during it. And then he goes on. We will be coming back to that life-changing phrase, but that's enough for now. And then he goes on. I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to read 5 through 8, and we'll stop there for today. Moreover, he says, in addition to that, he's kind of changing here a little bit. Now he's going to talk about the Babylonians again. He says, moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. His, like death, he, has, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Now, let me just pause for a minute because it sounds like we're talking about wine is greedy. Wine collects all nations. We'll see in the next verse God is talking about Babylon and about the king of Babylon. Basically, he's saying here, and if you read it in a lot of other versions, it kind of comes through more clearly. He's saying that uh, Babylon, the king of Babylon and all of Babylon with him, they, they, they stagger across the world they swagger and brag their way across the world like a, like a drunken man, conquering everything in their path. Verse 6, Shall not all these, the, the peoples and nations that he has conquered, shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him, woe, woe to you, Babylon. You thought you were such hot stuff. Woe to you who heaps up what is not your own. For how long? How long do you think that can last? And he loads himself with pledges. Verse 7, talking to Babylon. Now, will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Now that last business for the blood of the earth, that's a refrain and it'll come up again and it's the Holy Spirit's way, it's Habakkuk's way of just kind of summing the whole thing up with this, with a little chorus saying, because Babylon, because you've been so cruel, so oppressive and so horrible to uh, the people less uh, powerful than you, including my own people, said, because of all the blood you've spilled, I'm coming to get you. Gonna, I'm going to cause all the peoples that you have destroyed eventually are going to be able to, under my empowerment, are going to pull it together and attack you, and you're going to get yours. You're coming down forever. The rest of the chapter deals with that more specifically. Um, let's see. This might be a good place to end today. Um, I want to say one thing about wine because there's going to be somebody out there who says, um, why, aren't you, why aren't you teaching against drinking? This is saying that, that drinking does all of this. Well, I'm going to say two things about that. One, it's not saying that. He's talking about the king of Babylon and he's saying it's, it's, it's as though he were drunk the way he, he conquers. If he really were drunk, if he meant that literally, he wouldn't be able to conquer anybody. He'd trip over his own feet. Um, so he's saying he acts, you know, just like he's not in his right mind. He's just bragging and, and swaggering and, and killing everybody in sight. Now, having said that, I want to add, he's using alcohol and drunkenness more explicitly as a bad example. <laughs> He doesn't say, you know, he's like something else. He chooses something bad. He's like a drunken man. So we are not advocating drinking or drunkenness here. But I do want to make it clear that he's not talking about alcohol does all these things. He's saying Babylon does all these things and acts much as though he were drunk. So, on that note, let's just summarize what we've looked at today. 
This is rather a short lesson, but if I did the whole chapter, it would be way too long. So we're going to break it up into two shorter sessions. First of all, Habakkuk has said, you know, God, explain yourself. Are you going to let them get by with it? When they do come in, when, when you do send in the Babylonians, are you just going to let them destroy us and not do anything about it? And God basically says, no, Habakkuk, I am going to do something about it. I am going to make sure they get their just desserts. I'm, I'm going to punish them very badly. And there's more to come on that. Uh, and he says, in the meantime, you just settle down. Understand that if you look at me, if you live by the light of my word, you're going to be okay during this. You and anyone else that lives by the light of my word, you can thrive during this time. So that's a good place to leave it today. Thriving in the midst of danger, thriving in the midst of distress. Is that even possible? Oh yes it is. I've experienced it many times. It, sometimes it means I'm going to save you physically. I'm, I'm going to miraculously protect you so that nothing happens to your life. That's a scriptural reality. Sometimes that doesn't happen if God's appointed time for me is different. But it sure can happen. It's a part of that picture. But it also means that I'm going to find a deep, peace and a contentment during all of this. I will not feel restless. I will not feel afraid. I will not feel hopeless. I will even learn to have joy during the hard times. When I listen to the Lord, when I read the clear vision and run with it, when I take it to the bank and cast my life on what God has said, whether it makes sense to me or not, I will thrive. It's happened to me. I know it works. And I just challenge you all to do the same. I'll give you a small example from my life. I think of times when, well, you know what? I will use one of the more recent sorrows that we've lived through. My granddaughter, uh, as many of you know, died of a brain tumor a couple years ago after Oh, it was six or seven years of living with it and it was a very difficult experience for our family there's no doubt about it and I was I would agonize over it and pray and I lived in another country I could only see her once a year but though oh what precious memories I have of those visits but finally God got through to me and he started telling me in his word leave it with me there's nothing you can do. Just trust me. Don't be afraid. From Mark. Um, and then other verses that would say things like, um, just trust me. Don't be afraid. Cheer up. Rejoice. And I thought, you know, if I really believe that God has this on his calendar, he has a purpose in it, he could have healed her many times over with all the worldwide prayer going on for seven years. He didn't. But oh, so many wonderful things he accomplished through that little life. That's another story. But I thought, okay, if I'm going to take God at face value, if I'm going to live by the light of his word, I'm going to leave her in his hands to do what he will. And I choose happy. I'm going to find ways every day to rejoice and be happy, even with all that going on, because God told me to. And you know, it is possible. You can get to that happy place no matter what's happening in your life if you live by the light of God's word, if you read the vision and run with it. So that's where we'll leave it for today. Next week, God has more to say in answer to Habakkuk's questions. So until next time, bye.